this blizzard, I would, I would appreciate that. Um, this year's theme is revival, um, and I, I hope you guys are enjoying this series. I've been really loving this series because uh, God is just so powerful, isn't he? It's incredible uh, how good we are at messing things up. Uh, we are really, really gifted, some of us more than others, um, at just messing things up. Uh, we mess things up in our own lives. Uh, we mess things up in other people's lives. Then you have the ripple effects. When we make bad decisions, um, there's this ripple effect that just is never ending. Um, thank God we have a God who is a God of order, who is a God of grace. He's a God of mercy, and he's a God of revival. I think part of the reason why we mess up so often is because we have this deep need for relevance. Um, if you think about that, uh, I think that's probably natural. That's probably normal. But we have this really um, grafted in need to be relevant. Uh, and humility takes incredible amounts of discipline. Uh, because we have a need for relevance, um, we see things like this. This kind of caught my attention. I just saw this this morning. I had to put it in here. Did you know you can fly from any airport without announcing it on Facebook? <laughs> I like this because, right, so many people do that. I'm traveling from this airport to this airport, and I've been guilty of doing it before. Um, I've done it a handful of times, and I always feel weird doing it. But I have other friends that they're, every time they travel, they're like, I'm at, I'm at Pittsburgh and I'm headed to wherever. Um, why? Why do we need to announce that to all of our friends that we're traveling from one point to the other? What's the point? What's the purpose? If you actually stop and think about that, I don't know. <laughs> I guess it's relevance. We want people to know that we're traveling and that we're traveling to a cool place and that we're going on a cool trip. And we want to document that. Perhaps the need for relevance is grafted or, or even rooted in our need for love and acceptance. And again, I think that's normal. I think that's natural. And I think oftentimes whenever we, we, we don't have healthy relationships, our need for relevance starts to take off and it starts to grow and grow and grow and so we start doing really weird bizarre things to be irrelevant um, I started typing in a Google search and I typed latest and I put the letter D and it filled out based on algorithms it filled out the rest of that it said dangerous challenge which incidentally is what I was actually looking for uh, because I wanted to know this week what is the latest dangerous social media challenge. Does anybody know what it is? Can't keep up with them, right? We had the Tide Pods. That was so 19 or 2019. Uh, now, as of last week, the latest challenge is on TikTok. It's called the Skull Breaker Challenge. Anybody know what it is? Well, it's exactly what it sounds like. The Skull Breaker Challenge is where um, they convince their friends to dance and they, they're going to teach them a new dance and then there's a friend standing on either side of them and they kick their feet out from underneath them and then they fall down and hit the floor. Um, we have a desperate need for relevance. We look at the, 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 the stupid and sometimes inhumane things that people do and you ask why and I think it all boils down to that. We have this craving to be irrelevant. And before we all laugh and shake our heads and you know wag our fingers at people, um, all of us are vulnerable to this in different ways. We all have this capacity to feel relevant. Uh, Ethan Church or Ethan Couch, rather. That name may not sound familiar, but when I start talking about this, I think some of you will recognize this. Uh, June fifteenth, two thousand thirteen, at the age of sixteen, Ethan Couch. Uh, was speeding 70 miles an hour down a back road in his pickup truck with seven other passengers. There was a disabled SUV on the side of the road. Uh, a couple people came out of a house to help, and a youth minister stopped and pulled his car off to the side of the road, and he was helping the woman who uh, had broken down in this disabled SUV. Ethan Couch 
uh, struck the SUV, struck some of the people, killing four, uh, all four of the people who were outside of his vehicle and injuring and paralyzing one of the passengers who was in his pickup truck. Uh, you may recognize this story because his attorney sued and, and was giving a defense for uh, affluenza. Uh, not influenza, affluenza. Affluenza is whenever you grow up in a rich house and you're spoiled and your parents never say no to you, and then it becomes this communicable disease. Um, it's not diagnosable, but it was first coined in the 1950s. Um, Incidentally, he got off with uh, probation, and then ironically, uh, he disappeared. His probation officer couldn't find him, so they did a big manhunt, and they found him with his parents in Mexico. They were hiding out in Mexico. Uh, he was brought back. He was given a two-year prison sentence. But when Ethan Couch was at the age of 13, he was driving himself to a private charter school that his parents were paying for. When the schoolmaster questioned him on it, his dad threatened to purchase the school. Over and over and over, we may laugh at the affluenza uh, defense by his attorney, but there's something to it. Uh, Ethan Couch had this desperate need to be relevant, and his parents fueled that in a very unhealthy way. My question is, what if we fueled that in a healthy way, because there's nothing wrong with having a need to be relevant, having a need to be loved. But another question is, have churches clawed their way to be relevant to the point where it's become unhealthy? Some of you may have heard this in the news this past week, the church that paid off $46.5 million in medical bills. Has anybody heard that? Raise your hand if you've heard that. Two of you read the news. Three of you read the news. <laughs> so it's everywhere in the news, uh, national news everywhere. Um, Crossroads Church in Cincinnati, uh, this is uh, the title of a Fox News article, and it's replicated across a lot of different news uh, media outlets. But Fox News says, Cincinnati Church wipes out $46.5 million in medical debt for 45,000 families. When you hear that title, you're thinking, wow, that's really incredible. And it is. I mean, I, uh, uh, and this is not knocking the church in any way. I think, I think what they did is noble. I think they should be acknowledged for what they did. However, there's more to that story. The church didn't pay $46.5 million. The church paid $4.6 million. And an organization called RIP Medical Debt pays $10,000 for every $100 that's donated. So RIP Medical Debt, this organization, paid 100 times the amount of medical debt that Crosspoint Church did, or Crossroads Church. Now, Crossroads Church, still pretty significant, uh, $4.6 million is huge. But $4.6 million of a church with a weekly attendance of, are you ready for this? 36,000 people is an average of about $125 per person, which is still pretty significant. Uh, that's still pretty impressive. But what bothers me a little bit about this story is that this church, it appears, were the ones who contacted the media, and they framed it in a way where it looks like the church paid $46 million in debt, which is, uh, this size has never been paid before, and that's why it's national news. It's deceptive. And it's this need to be relevant and to say, look what we're doing, and we're helping people in this dramatic, crazy way. Now, again, what they did was really important. It was really impressive. I, I can't knock them whatsoever for raising $4.6 million dollars. But the way that they announced it uh, is pretty self-serving, in my opinion. So, where does this all tie in? Uh, today we're talking about uh, not because of righteousness. We're talking about the Israelites who went into the promised land. Now remember, God promised them that he was going to do that. God said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless this people, and you're going to enter into this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
you're going to be very rich. Um, you're, you're, there's going to be this abundance. Um, you're going to go in and you're going to take possession of this land. Now, God issued a very strong warning. God said, make sure that when you go in there, that you don't tell people that it's because of my righteousness. Now, why is that important? There's a very strong temptation, even since the beginning of time, to be relevant. To say, you know, God has blessed me, but it's because I'm a really good person. And if you don't think this happens today, uh, I just read a study that talks about the prosperity gospel, right? The prosperity gospel says, if you tithe 10% of your income, God's going to give you far more than that in return. Like, not that God might give you that in return, but God will bless you beyond what you've given or then more. Um, the problem with that is that it's not biblical. And what's interesting is, I think it was four out of six Christians today in, in the United States believe that the prosperity gospel message is true. That it's biblical, that if they give... Uh, 10% of their income that God's going to bless them and that they will not struggle financially. Well, what's the problem with that? Um, there are a lot of documentaries out there that show churches that are steeped in prosperity gospel leave a swath of people who are homeless. People who were just barely making their bills, believing that if they bump up their, their giving to 10%, that God would take care of them, God would bless them, and that 10% pushed them over the the edge on their budget and they're losing their homes they're losing their cars families are being split apart there's a swath of carnage that's left in the wake of the prosperity gospel see this need for relevance is killing people quite literally so it's dangerous territory i think if if we say that the god of revival is going to just bless us beyond measure. If we just, if we just give, give our time, give our money, um, God is just going to bless us in return, and, 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 you know, it's just going to happen. I believe that God will bless us. I believe that God does bless us. I look around this room, and I look at all the problems that so many of you have had in the last year. This congregation has faced more problems than a church of 500 faces in five years. And I look around this room and I, I beam with pride because people are still here and they're still upright and they're still smiling and they're still present. That's how God blesses us. God blesses us because he cares for us and he revives us and he restores us. I'm going to reread this scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 9 verses 1 through 5. Not because of righteousness. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today, to go in to, uh, to dispossess nations greater and mightier than you, cities great and fortified up to heaven. Does that sound a little intimidating? Because it is. You're going to cross the Jordan on dry ground, first of all. That's a little intimidating. Keep in mind, it wasn't these people who crossed the Red Sea. It was their ancestors. This is new territory for them, to cross the Jordan on dry ground. And then he says, you're going to come in, and you're going to dispossess nations that are greater and mightier than you. They're powerful. They're rich. They're strong. They have this big military presence, and you're going to come in, and it's your job to annihilate them and to kick them out of their own land and to take possession of it. A people, verse 2, a people great and tall, the sons of the Anakim, whom you know, and of whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak? These are not small people. These are massive people, massive, powerful people with a lot of money. They're physically tall and strong. Their militaries are tremendously powerful. And God's saying, you're going to come in and you're going to take possession. Verse 3, Know therefore today that he who goes over before you as a consuming fire is the Lord your God. He would destroy them and subdue them before you. So you shall drive them out and make them perish quickly. 
as the Lord has promised you. Now, let me stop and ask you the question. Can you see in the need for our relevance where this might go south? Because, by the way, they did enter in on dry ground. They did take possession of the land, as God promised. They annihilated entire cities. They pushed the people out. And the Israelites took possession of it and divided up the land into 12 different territories. Do you see where, when there's a need for relevance, people might come back and say, look what we did. It's very tempting, isn't it? And it's very tempting to package that in a way that makes it seem like God was the one who did it. But you're really bragging about it yourself. Man, we went in there and we just annihilated them. We didn't stand a chance. Can you imagine Gideon? I, did, I was shaking in my boots. I was hiding and I was asking for all these signs and, and I had 300 people and we went in there. We whooped those people. Can you see the temptation? But it's a subtle temptation, and I think a lot of us are vulnerable to get into that trap. So humility is an absolute discipline. And we need to teach our children that this need and this desperation to be relevant needs to be rooted in something other than TikTok and other than Facebook and other than even something as simple as showing people where we're flying to. Um, documenting every part of our lives, we need to teach our kids that their relevance is in Jesus Christ. And that we're going to be the ones to give them love and acceptance. And it's going to be healthy. And it's going to be consistent. And we're going to show our kids our mistakes. And we're going to show them that it's okay to make mistakes because God is a God of revival. God comes back um, and he says, Do not say in your heart, after the Lord God has thrust them out before you, it is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. Whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. Not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess their land. But because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out from before you, and that he may confirm the word that the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I think this is really important for a number of reasons. And one, we talk so much about how God hates oppression. God despises, he loathes wickedness. And there are so many churches right now because of their need to be relevant. That they say, look, we welcome everybody. No matter what they've done, no matter what they're doing right now, no matter where they're at in their life, it does not matter. You are welcome here. And I think that's dangerous. Not that we shouldn't welcome people in. I'm not saying that whatsoever. But there's this battle that we're fighting every single day to save people from the clutches of genuinely oppressive people who are inflicting really, really bad harm on people because churches in their desperation to look relevant are coming back and saying, look how, look how much mercy we extend to people. We're a church of mercy. We're a church of grace. We're going to turn a blind eye to wickedness, which essentially is what they're doing. They're not saying it that way, but what they're doing is they're turning a blind eye to, to injustices and wickedness in order to look relevant. Look what we've done. This is exactly the thing that God is warning the Israelites against. Don't you dare say it's because of your righteousness, but it's because of their wickedness. And what I do to wicked people is I drive them away. I drive them out. I send them away because it's not okay for people to do this to each other. It's not okay for people to, to slay the innocent. It's not okay for people to oppress people economically, to oppress them physically. It's not okay. And when there's wickedness, thank God we serve a God who drives them out. So I think this message is still relevant today. Thousands of years later, this message is equally as relevant today. That when we hunger for relevance, we really need to hunger for righteousness. And ironically, 
our righteousness shouldn't be boasted. We shouldn't say it's because of our righteousness that we're blessed. But it's because we're a weak, humble people who desperately need God in our lives. It's because of him. It's because of him. This year, as we continue this uh, theme on revival, I hope that we all pray often um, for snow and other things, uh, but mostly for snow. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I hope that we pray. I hope we really genuinely pray for each other. Um, this past week, uh, there were quite a few of our own number who were, uh, who were really ill, um, who were lonely, uh, who were down, and I received um, quite a few phone calls from people saying, you wouldn't believe the number of people from within this congregation who contacted me. Um, I love that. And I love that about you guys. And the fact that the people who are doing the visitations and the calls don't ever come back and tell me or tell our elders is super cool. Um, I love that about this congregation. Keep doing that. Keep blessing people. Keep being present in their lives. And genuinely watch what God does with that. God is a God of revival. He's awesome, and I pray that you go out this week and just have a blessed week. If there's anybody this morning who is not yet a child of God, who has put Christ on in baptism, we would invite you to come up, or our shepherds will be in the back. Or if you have any prayer needs, we would invite you to come up or see our shepherds in the back as we all stand and sing together.